Thank you very much, kids of praise. Ay, hindi na ito salamat. We are reminded, brothers and sisters, that we have our mission to go and tell the world that Jesus Christ indeed is born and has come into this world to offer us salvation. And let us all praise the Lord for that. Can we say amen? Thank you. You might uh, probably wonder, just about a uh, Sabbath or two, I was uh, standing here before you. Last Wednesday, I follow up, followed up our scheduled or assigned speaker this morning. But uh, all our workers, probably, if not all, most of them, the district pastors from the different districts of this conference and also our leaders and the Negros Occidental Conference headquarters are right now in Hidubaan for a very special purpose. It is the ordination of uh, one pastor, our pastor in, in Hinubaan, and that is uh, Pastor Binkian, Samuel Binkian. Together with his wife and the family, they will be ordained to the, the ministry today. So, one of the elders have told me that if ever possible, I could have the opportunity to be with my people, I should always have to grab that uh, opportunity. So here I am again this time and hope to bring the message of the Lord to each one of us today. We are towards the end of the year 2017. And to remind each one, especially our children, members of the, oh yeah, hello, how are you? Members of the Kids of Praise, we, though we believe that Christ is born, has come to this world, but not on this month, probably not on this month, specifically not on that uh, particular date of this month. We believe that Jesus has come as the Word of God has promised, and His name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. And I'm very happy to witness, brothers and sisters, the many blessings of the Lord that has transpired in this church. Also, in each of our lives, that we were able to surpass all those trials, the tra challenges that has come in our families, and we are still here, able to keep this faith. I hope that until Christ will come, we will still be here, keeping this faith alive in our hearts and in our minds. I will be talking to you at least three lessons that we could take from the lake of uh, Tiberias. As we were told, much of the time of Christ's ministry had been passed near the Sea of Galilee. By the way, Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias, and, uh, or the Lake of Tiberias, and um, the Lake of Genesareth, just one. As the disciples gathered in a place where they were not likely to be disturbed, they found themselves surrounded by reminders of Jesus and his mighty works. On this sea, the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Tiberias, filled their hearts with excitement, witnessing all those miracles Christ has done. And on this sea, when their hearts were filled with terror, we know the story behind they were being charged to, to take the dead body of Jesus from the grave, from the graveyard, and they were charged to, to steal that body, okay? Because it has been prophesied even by Jesus himself that after three days, 
of his death, he will, he will be resurrected. So, that was the story. Now, filled with terror and the fears, what might people say? They gathered in this place, and storm was hurrying them to destruction. Jesus had walked upon the billows of their rescue. Here in this place, in the Sea of Galilee, the tempest had been hushed by his word, Peace, be still. Here in this lake, within sight was the beach, where above 10,000 people had been fed by the, how many loaves? Five loaves of bread and two fishes of fishes. Anyhow, not far distant was Capernaum, the scene of so many miracles as the disciples looked upon the scene, all these wonders that they have witnessed from the Lord, from the Master. Their minds were full of the words and deeds of the Savior. Seven of them, seven of the disciples were in, in, in the company. They were clad in the humble garb of fishermen. They were poor in worldly goods, but rich in the knowledge and practice of the truth. How I wish that could be fine in each one of us. We might be poor in worldly goods. May we be rich in the knowledge and practice of the truth. Just like these disciples. In which, at this very moment, the sight of heaven gave them the highest rank as teachers. They had not been students in the schools of the prophets, but for three years, about three years and a half, they had been taught by the greatest educator the world has ever known. Under his instruction, they had become, or they become elevated, intelligent, refined agents through whom men might be led to a knowledge of the truth. In John chapter 21, and in verse 3, we were told that the evening was pleasant. And Peter, who still had much of his old love for boats and fishing, how I wish each one of us could experience, could have at least an experience in going fishing. Yeah, how, how nice. Me and my son are fond of this when we were in Romlon. Okay. Within fact, one of those experiences, we were in a, in a very small boat, in a, in a paddle boat, where the strong winds and the mighty waves suddenly struck us. And I told to myself, probably this might be the end of the world. We don't know what to do. We're not experts, uh, paddlers of that uh, small boat. But yet God has sent us somebody to, to rescue us from that cruel ocean. Well, Peter, that evening, proposed that they should go out upon the sea and cast their nets. In this plan, all were ready to join. And they were in need anyway. They were in need of food and clothing, which the proceeds of a successful night's fishing, which they believe, would supply. They went out in their boat, but all the night, we know the story, they caught nothing. All night they toiled without success. In verse 4, John tells us that early the next morning, all the while, there was a lone watcher upon the shore followed them with his eye. Well, he himself was unseen. Okay? At length, the morning dawned. And yes, as I have said in verse 4, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize who he was. The disciples didn't realize who that man was 
uh, standing on the shore. Okay. You could probably follow the story in uh, chapter 21 of John. Now, I would like to emphasize this point number one for us to learn out from this story. I have at least three. The dawn in man's life may cause not to be able to recognize or even forget the giver or our savior. What are those? Probably the dawns in life. Dawns in life may be education. Okay. Some of us, there are lots of our, our young people who will come to some of us here and then ask for a special prayer. Please pray for us. We will be taking this coming Sunday our examination, licensure's examination. But listen to this. Mrs. White has said in the, in the Desire of Ages, pages 69 and 70, true education would lead the youth, probably each one of us, the learner, should I say. True education would lead the learner to seek the Lord. But in their search after knowledge, they turned away from the source of wisdom. One time, I think that was uh, Dr. Tibaliara, if, I was, if I'm not wrong, who was uh, requested to pray, to have a special prayer for those few of those young people, right, right here in our church. But when he tried to recognize where are they, they were not found inside the church. Okay? And I have to address this one, because if nobody will address this, who else will? As your church pastor, I would like to challenge each one. Let's be true and sincere in our relationship with the Lord. Again, true education should lead the learner, each one of us, to seek the Lord. And let us never forget Him. And many, many times it happened. Not only in this church, I tell you. You're not alone, by the way. I have witnessed so many young people asking, pleading, with in fact they themselves together with the family, their, their siblings, their parents, doing some fasting and praying because tomorrow, the following day, they will take the licentious examination. But afterwards, when they get the passing result, okay, why not? Di na naton makita. Probably, makita man naton in the church. But yet, they could not also deny the request or the, the urges of, their, of the deaf ed to join some activities during the Sabbath. See? Or probably, those in life that will, that will push us not to recognize the Lord, prosperity. Okay? Prosperity. I have requested Dr. Tobiliara to read this specific verse. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, this is very important for each one of us to consider, brothers and sisters. In my Bible, it says in verse 6, Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. The key here is contentment. But the great gain in godliness is with contentment. For, in verse 7, we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. In verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, I don't know if who among us here could raise our hands that, and could say that we are contented with food and clothing. Huh? I don't know if uh, there might be some gadgets in those times if Paul will also include mentioning it here. Again, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with this. I would like each one to ponder these thoughts. Are we contented of food and clothing? When I saw when I saw my friends, my colleagues, Pastor Toledo, I will name them, Pastor Toledo and Pastor Canopin, that they have a, a, a nice coat, 
I tried to inquire, where did you buy that? Where did you, you, you purchase that? And they told me when they were once upon a time in, uh, in Thailand, they bought it for about six, six or seven hundred pesos only. Okay. And when I tried to inquire, to, to look for it, the same, the same uh, uh, linen, uh, the same style, the same fit, in Divisoria, it was sold to me for 1,800. My point is, we always try to feel something, what's that? Uh, envy or zealous kung may makita kita sa iba natin ng mga kauturan ng mayara sila if we have food and clothing we will be content with this in verse 9 but those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for in verse 10 for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. I'm not trying to say here that if we prosper, it is a curse for us. With in fact, that is what God wants to, from His people, to prosper. Not only in material things, not only in, in the worldly things, even in health, for each one of us to enjoy life in this world. So prosperity, in other words, is a blessing from the Lord, but to the point that we will really cling for that, long for that, to have that. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Don'ts in life might be promotion in our work. Or it might be conversion, even conversion. I heard lots of people saying, uh, it's it sometimes like a, 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 a ting, tingling symbols. Okay? If I was not, if I didn't become, if I, I didn't, I, I, I hasn't experienced conversion, I might not be like this today. Okay? You know what I mean? The dawns in man's life will bring us sometimes not to recognize or even forget our Lord and Savior. In verses 5 and 6, the boat was but a little way from the shore. It is recorded that it is about uh, 100 yards from the shore. So a little less than 100 meters. Lapit-lapit lang. Probably, diri lang sa ngakon kinatidlogan kag... It might be shorter than that uh, car I am facing right now. So, very near. And if you try to shout in places that are so... Wala um, mga tao, okay? You will be clearly heard by that distance. So, the disciples saw a stranger upon, upon the, standing upon the beach who asked them the question... Children, hey, people, there, have you any meat? Have you any fish right now? And when they answered no, he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore. I don't know what, what difference will it make. Even if you will be in a, in a, very, in a very big roro, you will cast your net here. And then somebody will tell you, uh, no, no, don't, don't, uh, what's this? Don't cast it in the left side, in the right side. I don't know what difference will it make. Wala mga isda diri? Probably are this a right sign. Jesus, in whom the disciples didn't know that it was he, told them to cast their net on the right side. Here's the second point I would like to emphasize. Let us remember this. Working in faith, or working with faith in Jesus, 
is always guaranteed success. Listen to this, what Mrs. White had seen in his vision. While they were doing his work, she said, he, this is Jesus, will provide for their needs. And how many times we lack faith in this, in this statement of the servant of God. While we will be doing the work of the Lord, God will provide our needs. Amen? Amen? And Jesus had a purpose in bidding them cast their net on the right side of the ship. Because on that side, he stood upon the shore. And that was the side of faith, brothers and sisters. If they labored in connection with him, his divine power combining their human effort, they could not fail to success. This is a guaranteed statement, brothers and sisters. And never in our lives, to tell you honestly, Mrs. Golfan and I started at the very beginning since we got married. We hadn't some privileges like the many who have some gifts. We really started all by ourselves because we started it wrong. But nevertheless, God has prospered us. And since we entered into the ministry, I could not recall a time when there was a single day that we were not able to feed or even to eat with our children three times at least a day. God has been so good to us. If we will work in faith to Jesus, there is always a success. Now, to make the story shorter, when they had finished breakfast, we know the story, when they were yet in the ocean, and when they realized later, especially when John, one of those seven, mentioned it was the Lord, Peter right away put on his clothes and then jumped and gone yet to Jesus. Now, when they, everyone of them got into the shore, they found out that there was already a charcoal with a, with a fire and there was a fish in it and some bread. Now, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? More than those things that they, have, they were enjoying. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, then feed my sheep. Or rather, feed my lambs. And then in verse 16, to, to, uh, down to verse 19, we are told that it happened three times. Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Three times. Do you love me? And by this time, Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Friends, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? And probably after explaining to Peter something about the nature of his death he may have in the future, they moved a little farther from the others. And when they walked a little bit ahead, here comes the, the third point I would like to emphasize. Peter, in verse 20, Peter turned and saw the disciples, the disciple whom Jesus loved, following them. Okay? The one who also had leaned, this disciple, back against him, against Jesus, during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? Now, when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? What about this man? Brothers and sisters, our business in life is to look and follow no one but Christ. But how many times in our lives each day that we are able to focus our, our eyes and see this man? How about this man? Lord, 
How about this man? And then Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? And I could imagine, brothers and sisters, if Jesus is here and he will hear us asking, How about this man? Lord, he will probably tell us also, What is it to you then? Ano git say mo? Anong pakimo? If, okay, the point Jesus that he emphasized to Peter is follow me. Follow me. Follow me. We are told in, again, in the Desire of Ages, Mrs. White said, it is the duty of everyone to follow Christ. Follow me, he said. Do not run ahead of me. This is oftentimes our young people is in this situation. Because on the other hand, we have that, we have that understanding that anyway, God will, will understand and will know probably what lies ahead of me and he knows what is best for me. So I will do this and that. But Jesus said, follow me. Do not run ahead of me. Then you will not have the host of Satan to meet alone. Jesus said, let me go before you. And you will not be overcome by the enemy. Brothers and sisters, obedience in following him was the duty required from each of us. How many today are like Peter? They are interested in the affairs of others and anxious to know their duty, anxious to know what happened, anxious to know what might, be, what might probably has been told to him, to them. While, Mrs. White said, while they are in danger of neglecting their own, it is our work to look to Christ and follow him. We shall see mistakes in the lives of others, brothers and sisters, and the defects in their character. But in Christ, we shall find perfection. Now let us not get uh, mixed with this. Okay? Probably here. St. Paul told us, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. In some other versions, we are told, consider the affairs of others. And that is the positive. Okay? But what I'm trying earlier to say is the negative. And most often, we are in this situation. Interested in the affairs of others and anxious to know about what they're doing while we are in danger of neglecting our own. The wisest king tells us in Proverbs chapter 6, another person, verse 12, a wicked man walketh with a forward mouth. Verse 13, he winketh his eyes when he speaks. He speaks with his feet. Okay. Have you noticed those gestures? He even teacheth or pointeth fingers to others. In verse 14, 14 Frowardness in, is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly, and suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. That is the great warning to each one of us, brothers and sisters. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are in abomination unto him. Verse 17. A proud look, a lying tongue, a hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Those are the things that our God hates. To close, let us remember that instead of looking 
our eyes to some of us here. I would like to share to you a very short experience in the life of Abraham. It is recorded in Genesis chapter 15. We know that God had covenanted with Abraham to become the father of all nations. But after all those years, at the age of 90, still he has no son to inherit the things God has given him. Except Eliezer, the faithful and trusted servant. After reasoning with God, the Lord brought him outside his tent and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. My friends, beloved brothers and sisters, look toward heaven. Look toward heaven. Focus our eyes on Jesus where we can find perfection in Him and Him alone. May God bless us all this morning.